morning um, my name is Limin Yuan I'll be uh, talking about common hand infections today so uh, before I start uh, I've always tell myself and to the students uh, the few students uh, that I'm responsible for that uh, learning is a never-ending story in our life and uh, more so in a uh, surgical life uh, because surgery is an apprenticeship like my teacher always told me where we always follow one master or sifu who uh, has seen it all and been through all uh, learn their kung fu they say and until you are so good before you invent your own style uh, this presentation is nothing more than a sharing of uh, one of the many online webinars uh that has become a new norm since this humbling pandemic has started uh these particular slides are from uh ao trauma north america hand online course by john alpha and carl bickle and common hand infections are so uh, common and yes uh been our objective today to be able to identify the major types of hand infection uh, describe the principles of the management of the major principles of the hand infections recognize some controversies uh, not many of them associated with hand infections appreciate that infection prevention and management is part of a hand surgery practice it's Hippocrates and this is Cannavale on the right side uh, Hippocrates has uh, uh, started treating uh, hand infections many many years ago thousands of years ago that the major principles are still hold true today uh, mainly uh, keeping the wounds open draining them and uh, doing the dressing uh, frequently uh, Cannavale as a american surgeon who has invented and who studied the hand extensively and uh, many of our uh, treatment principles are based on his studies uh, hand infections are one of the many that uh, we uh, quite um, uh, encounter we encounter very frequently and that we are quite confident to have them treated and uh, get a good outcome from uh, however not all of these are hand infections uh, we uh, our aim is to be able to recognize which one is and which one is not hand infections uh, first of all a patient who presented to us uh, has always complained of some um, wounds in the hand um, you must always ask Tara history because uh, most of the diagnosis uh, we could get from uh, history alone um, plus physical examination of course so when has the uh, injury started when has the lesion started how was the mechanism that leads to this injury or this lesion um, not many times that the patient will have will remember that uh, they have uh, some injury in the hand uh, most of them or uh, some of them uh, will come with the they say spontaneous spontaneously uh, swollen spontaneously this having this discharge from the hand so uh, signs and symptoms plays a very important role um, in diagnosis and how does it progress how long has it been is it a chronic type or is it an acute type of infection uh, patients uh, factors are very very important when we are assessing hand injuries or hand infections uh, right or left hand handedness their occupation uh, their host factors the, the whole patient's host factors meaning that any underlying medical issues surgical issues and if you want to pick one of the most important uh, medical background then you want to ask about any uh diabetes uh, background uh, because uh, this has made up of most of our 
uh, infected patients. Uh, not to forget the tetanus uh, background and the history of drug allergies. And last meal, of course, when we are talking about hand infections, most of them uh, needed uh, surgical intervention. And if, uh, let's say, uh, extensive development is needed, then they will need uh, general anesthesia and they need to be fasted. Uh, going into physical examinations, we must be an astute uh, observer when we are looking at the hand because this is such a delicate structure. Um, small areas, many, many structures. Uh, skin injuries look at all sides, especially the web spaces, which are always missed. Uh, any discharge from these areas or these wounds. Um, and redness, pain um, on active and passive motion, axial loading of uh, the fingers, any swelling, any warm. And warm is not always the, uh, the, the first apparent sign in, um, in hand infections, not like in other places. Any lymphatic swelling in the proximal area. And don't, not to forget to compare to the unaffected skin on the other side. Um, sometimes, but not all the time, we will need um, uh, ancillary studies, uh, radiological laboratory and aspiration to help in our diagnosis. Um, X-ray, uh, plain radiograph, uh, meant for these few reasons. Uh, sometimes, uh, which is very important as well, foreign bodies can have uh, can occur and uh, in especially in diabetic patient with um, uh, neuropathy they might not notice that there's a needle in their body uh, it has happened to us before um, to have a patient with uh, infection but with not knowing that there's a foreign body in their in their uh, hand and fingers uh, any subcutaneous gas uh, might indicate very severe infections Osteomyelitis will uh, be apparent in the X-ray or pain radiograph in two to three weeks' time. So this will uh, uh, tell us that this infection has been there for some time already. Uh, laboratory studies, uh, sometimes we will need it uh, for the workup of the patient or we might need this one in the long term in a serial uh, review to assess the recovery as well. And sometimes when we are not sure, uh, we might need um, some culture or crystal um, to see, uh, the, look for the real diagnosis. Uh, general treatment principle uh, as such. Uh, first of all, because the hand is very um, delicate and uh, infection spreads very fast, we often need to uh, do some markings on the skin uh, to look for any progression uh, of the erythema or swelling. Um, most, of the surgical in, uh, most of the hand infection will need surgical development uh, because as it has held true for so many years, thousands of years already, uh, infective material need to be exposed and drained until it is healed. Um, nowadays, we are blessed with uh, IV antibiotics, but never um, uh, try to abuse uh, antibiotics. As a, a responsible health care provider, uh, uh, we must be aware of uh, antibiotic resistance and always get the culture and as soon as possible, turn down to the uh, appropriate uh, targeted antibiotic according to the culture as soon as possible as the culture comes back and don't be uh, get a good luck in the incision uh, for surgeons because uh, adequate uh, adequate exposure and adequate um, this one drainage of the infection is very important for the healing and they, they, the hand heals very fast if uh, the infective material is cleared properly 
uh, always culture before antibiotics and copious irrigation. These are the principles. Leave the wounds open either uh, with a packing. We pack with usually uh, dry uh, gauze or dry uh, ribbon gauze. Pen rolls is what we use. Sometimes the corrugated drain uh, to drain some very, very uh, uh, exudative wound. Some wounds, they, they have a lot, a lot of exudates. Some are less, then we do the packing. Some are very dry, then sometimes even the tendon exposed, then we need to add on some uh, gel or something like that to keep the moisture in balance. Um, spleen, initially, this is the meaning. After the surgical treatment, uh, we spleen the hand to uh, make sure it is immobilized and uh, for the initial beginning beginning part of the treatment, uh, so to reduce the inflammation, reduce the pain, but early motion. Early motion means like after about a week or two, uh, maximum two weeks, lah, you do the back slap, then um, for example, then you uh, remove the slap and allows early motion to prevent stiffness because stiffness is uh, the most common side effects of uh, hand injuries or hand infections. Even after adequate treatment, uh, the infection is settled down already, the wounds are healed, but the motions are um, most of the time um, uh, reduced because of stiffness. So early motion is very important. Uh, so we go on to um, the different types of uh, hand infections that are very commonly seen both in ED, emergency department, and also in our clinic. So paronychia is an infection of the uh, subcutaneous, uh, the, the nail folds, the lateral side, and the and the proximal side, which is called the eponychium. So paronychia is just the lateral side. Acute and chronic are the types. So acute types are most common ones. This is a actually the most common hand infections of all and they occur in children sometimes in, uh, in women more than men um, tra caused by trauma nail biting thumb sucking manicures and they're always uh staff arrest they're always staff arrest if not if not most of the time okay so um the treatment is um like the general principle drainage is the first line we need to drain them surgically uh, there are a uh, number of different ways that you can do it. Depends on the uh, extent of the um, infection. Lah. So if the infection goes to the eponychium, then we might need to extend to the eponychium. The eponychium is the area that proximal to the nail. Proximal. Uh, so uh, if a nail is uh, not viable, it's a very, very uh, sloughy underneath the nail, then we might need to remove part of the nail. But important thing is that we keep the infective area open and always, I mean, uh, regular warm soaks. We soak with, uh, usually we will ask for soaking with the KMNO4, warm soaks, uh, uh, and with uh, some antibiotics, usually uh, outpatient basis. Uh, uh, complications from this acute paronychia can be uh, nail deformity because uh, of the injury to the nail bed. Uh, run around infection means that the infection goes around the eponychium, hyponychium all around and subungual abscess it can cause abscess if it's not treated well. If it's more than six weeks, then it could be acute paronychia. It's not always um, uh, untreated or undertreated acute paronychia which has become chronic paronychia. Sometimes it happens in immunosuppressed patient or person who people who always uh, have a water immersion, uh, gardeners uh, uh, or workers in restaurants. Uh, so they have this um, uh, chronic paronychia with uh, different uh, organisms, sometimes fungal. Uh, they will have nail, nail plate discoloration, ridges, and their nail fold retracted. So the treatment is um, to uh, expose the uh, infective environment as well. So there's a method here called uh, 
uh, aponychial muscularization, where we remove part of the aponychium, sparing the nail bed, lah, and uh, frequent warm soaps, and the, to treat the chronic pamnichia. Phalon is the almost the second most common, to around 15 to 20% of um, uh, the hand infections. It is occurred in the, it happened in the uh, part of the finger, la, part of the finger distal to the, uh, distal in the phalangeal joint. Uh, this area has uh, fat inside a, a very tight uh, facial compartment, like our leg compartment like that. So uh, when infection happens in this fat, um, the pressure rise very fast and it has become, it has been described as a compartment syndrome like that for a finger dip. Okay, so this infection only happens in the distal interphalangeal joint, uh, distal to the DIP joint. So around this area with this um, fat pad inside. So sometimes penetrating injury can occur, can be the inciting factors, but most of the time, uh, you couldn't find a cause. A uh, staph aureus is usually the organism of in, organism that is uh, infect, infect, infecting this felon, and they can be redness, pain, swelling, uh, white or mortal. Different different presentation uh, depends on the timing that they present to us. Uh, the longer they wait, the dark, the darker it becomes because it's necrotic because it's uh, like compartment like that. You see. So the treatment is also the same. It's an emergency uh, drainage. We do it in outpatient clinic as well. Sometimes if it's early, uh, longitudinal incision, you can do uh, the incision on the side of the, on the fingers. We try to avoid the uh, palmar surface of finger to avoid some um, irritation or the scar problem later on. Um, draining the uh, pus or any collection in the in, in that area and frequent warm soaks as well. Untreated felon has uh, been associated with osteomyelitis. It will cause the bone to be uh, necrotic because of the uh, high pressure. Uh, septic tenosynovitis because, as we know, as you know, the uh, vola region, the palma region, is. Uh, there's a tendon there, the flexor tendon there is very nearby. So it can, the infection can spread to the tendon. Uh, it can spread to the, uh, to the paronychium as well, actually. And skin necrosis, if it's treated late, and sometimes amputation is uh, unavoidable. Uh, the next one is pyogenic flexor tenosynovitis. This is a long name for tendon infection. That's it. So the tendon, especially the flex, the flexor tendon, it is uh, covered with a layer of synovium. Synovium is very, very vascular. Uh, the, the tendon needs it, the synovium, for blood supply. Uh, bacteria also like it very much. So they will spread along the synovium very, very fast if it gets into the synovium and gets infected there. So we have seen the picture of Canavel before. The uh, four typical signs of uh, pyogenic flexor tenosynovitis are fusiform swelling, like sausage-like swelling like that. Uh, the finger is kept in a flex position because of the swelling, uh, because of the tendon, uh, in, uh, flexor tendon involvement. Uh, pain along the flexor tendon shift. This is a very important clinical sign that we need to elicit because sometimes we need to uh, differentiate pyogenic and also non-pyogenic. Sometimes dactylitis can happen in, uh, like for example, inflammatory inflammatory arthropathies uh, can happen. Dactylitis, the finger is swollen, fusiform, flex, but then it is not tender actually. Uh, so those are not infected. So the pain along the tendon shift is very important sign. We must be very careful. Uh, pain on a passive extension as well. So passively extend the fingers. Uh, it will elicit 
some uh, very excruciating pain for the patient. Uh, the history of flexor tenosynovitis patients, uh, like all other uh, finger infection, uh, sometimes the uh, inciting injury they cannot be elicited. Um, organisms are still the most common step aureus, but sometimes Pasteurella maltosida is uh, from animal bites, especially cat bites. Uh, management if uh, is kind of controversial nowadays because some says that uh, early, very very early infection uh, can be treated non-surgically, but uh, historically and uh, like what I was trained, uh, um, the flexor tenosynovitis is a uh, uh, orthopedic emergencies and need to be drained surgically immediately. There are a number of different ways that we can drain the infection. Uh, proximal distal incision using a feeding tube, uh, flushing it. Uh, this is not what I typically will do actually sometimes uh, because the uh, infection, if it's, uh, if it's very um, uh, severe, then we need very thorough a debridement of the infected synovium. So a uh, very, very small incision, draining it by flushing. This one only applies, I think, for, um, for a very, very early infection. And you're very sure that uh, you can clear the infection with this small in in incision, uh, which I uh, am very doubtful. So consider complete open decompression, OK? and splint the hand, the fingers, elevate it, antibiotics, and treat it early. You don't want to wait for uh, the gangrene to happen and you will lead to very uh, bad outcome. Sometimes may need to lead to amputation. Um, deep space infections, there are few hand spaces uh, in our palm. There are three most common ones. The most common is the tena space. Uh, next is the mid palmar space and the hypotena space. Parona space is uh, not in the palm. It is in the distal uh, forearm around the wrist area, vola area as well. And the important thing is that these um, areas, these spaces, they are potential spaces. They are not real spaces. These spaces open up only when there's an infection, when there's collection, and then it opens up. So uh, notice that there's a concavity in our hand. Notice that there's a shape of this, this concave shape in our palm area. So when uh, you see a patient, you compare the both hand, and then um, notice that this uh, concavity is lost, and it has become convex, swollen instead, then very likely that the patient will have some collection in their palma region, uh, palma deep space. So these spaces are called deep space, probably I think because they are located behind the flexor tendons. Uh, they are all behind the flexor tendons. That's why they are very deep and they don't manifest in the hand. Like sometimes, not always they have a like posture and discharging pass immediately. Sometimes it's just swollen and loss of concavity. So uh, be aware of that. Uh, not always you'll see some uh, past discharging from the uh, from the area. Okay, so the the so the treatment principle is also the same. Um, uh, early surgical debridement and uh, drainage. Keep the wound open uh, to uh, keep draining, uh, keep dressing until the wound is healed. Uh, there are a number of uh, ways um, to. Uh, to drain the infection. We always uh, study the hand. Um, there's no textbook uh, way to do it. Every, every single infection is different. Every hand is different, uh, as in all other cases in medical, in medical field. Um, in this particular case, in mid uh, there is a, a propensity to open the other spaces as well. All I mean is because uh, we have a couple tunnel proximally, 
to have a finger and a flexor tendon shift distally. So uh, when we do the incision, uh, we always uh, consider uh, whether we are going to extend proximally, whether we are going to extend distally. So our incision follow that one. Uh, we don't uh, simply put the incision there, follow the textbook, and then in the end, or when we want to do the carpal tunnel release, uh, when the infection, you notice that it's going to the carpal tunnel, oh, I need to make a separate, very small skin bridge incision. So it will be a bad effect. So we always consider every case uh, as a different case. Uh, collar button abscess is another type of um, hand infection. It's less commonly seen, but uh, uh, need to be aware of uh, because it is located in the web spaces. Uh, when the web spaces are swollen and the fingers are abducted away from each other, uh, means that some collection are there. Uh, at the web space. So uh, don't turn the patient away. Uh, study their hand and take the proper history and uh, make sure if there's an infection, drain it properly. Uh, there are a number of ways that we can do the incision as well. So I want to take your attention, like uh, Carl um, told us in the, in the webinar, he told us that uh, this um, um, hand, uh, fingers, uh, flexor tendons, they are uh, surrounded by a tendon shift. So this tendon shift, some of them are connected to each other. Uh, for example, you see the uh, second to fourth finger, we call it the index to ring finger. Uh, index to ring finger, their tendon shift is uh, until the level of PIP joint only. So uh, not like, unlike the, the thumb and also the little finger. Uh, so infection in the thumb and little finger, they can spread all the way to the, to the uh, wrist region and causing a so-called a horseshoe abscess because of the shape of that. So uh, we need to be aware of that and uh, plan our incision as such. Bites is another one. Um, not always animal bites. This picture is a typical uh, human bite. Uh, why is typical human bite? Because this is not uh, some person trying to bite him, but he go and punch that person and got his finger caught in the person's teeth. And that um, slight instance of contact of the, uh, of the uh, teeth to the uh, finger and the tendon and the extensor tendon uh, is enough to cause a very, very severe injuries, severe infections. This picture is a very rare picture of a patient, uh, someone's teeth lodged inside the person's hand. So uh, you see how strong is, is their punch. Huh? So um, this, is, um, this can become a very, very severe infection because mainly of the floral aura, uh, the oral flora in the uh, human uh, oral cavity, echina corrodens, all kind of, all kind of these horrific uh, bacteria in the oral cavity. And surgical deep exploration uh, is sometimes inadequate. So surgical exploration is especially important when we see uh, human bites uh, because of the uh, deep nature of these injuries. Why is it deep? Uh, first of all, the extensor area is very near to the joint. So any cut in the capsule is directly into the MCP joint already. And another thing is the tendons. When the finger is flexed, as we are always doing the, if you're not doing the, some fancy Kung Fu, we always, the punch is always in the flex finger. Okay, uh, flex fingers, the tendons are overlapped. So when the fingers are extended, the laceration in the tendon uh, uh, becomes displaced to other place, you see, more proximal, one more proximal, one more distal. So uh, inadequate um, surgical exploration uh, can lead to disaster uh, because the infection is not cleared properly, it can lead to a very, very bad infection. And next one is animal bite. Animal bite is a very common most of the time by 
uh, dog, but uh, 5% of cat bites leads to 76% of infected bites, meaning that the cat bites is less common, but very much more dangerous, very much more dangerous cat bites. I'll show you in a while why. The organism uh, involved in this animal bites, especially cat bites, is pasturella. It's uh, a very commonly asked question. Uh, some other uh, organisms are less common, but uh, Staph aureus is still the most common. Don't forget Staph aureus. Uh, for animal bites, uh, there are extra concerns uh, about tetanus and also rabies status. Uh, yes, these are much more important uh, things to think, think about when we are dealing with animal bites. So these are the pictures of uh, one uh, the cat and the other one is a dog. So uh, compared to both the teeth, uh, dog has a broad teeth and they causes broad because it's broad. So they causes uh, they cause uh, avulsion, tears, and crushing injuries. They cause structural damage to the muscles, to the tendons, nerves. So uh, and uh, cat bites are different. Cats teeth are very sharp narrowed and uh, the wound is not open it's like penetrating injury but very deep so uh, it's very difficult to deal with uh, not all the uh, wounds in the hands are um, bacterial infection or are infection as i said before we need to have a very uh, uh, good observation where we are dealing with a physical examination and uh, history taking. Because uh, by asking a few questions, you can differentiate uh, this, in, this lesion from bacterial infection. Uh, uh, why is it important? Because the treatment is different. And we treat it, if we treat viral infection like bacterial infection, then the result, we might cause more harm to the patient. Okay? So that's the reason why. Hepatic with low is typically vesicular. Vesicular means uh, vessel, uh, vesicles like uh, chicken pox are that, but very, very small ones. And they are concentrated in one area. And from the history, they're very, very important. History, ask the patient, then they'll tell you there's a prodromal burning sensation. And it become red first, become red, swollen. Then they, the vesicles appear. First, they appear separately. Then they slowly colors means that they are joined together or the vesicle small vesicle joined to become a big vesicle and then they become necrotic after that but this need not to be treated surgically uh, because any surgical intervention to this uh, to this um, uh, viral lesion can lead to more infection secondary infection we are talking about so this self-limiting limiting injuries or infection and uh, some will say antiviral uh, in immunocompromised patients, but that's not what uh, I practice. La. Septic arthritis uh, is the infection in the joint. Uh, they can be uh, gonococcal in adult patients, but the most common one is still staph aureus, as you can guess. Uh, uh, they, they presented with pain in axial loading, and we load the finger axially with pain. And uh, we, if we aspirate the joint, we have we get uh, less glucose because the, the principle is that they, the bacteria eat up the glucose in the joint in the joint fluid. Um, if we take the plain radiograph, we might see air in the joint, osteomyelitis changes, foreign body as well. Septic arthritis is a uh, uh, is a surgical emergency as well. We uh, typically uh, fast the patient overnight and do the surgery as soon as possible. And there are a number of ways that we can drain the joints. So uh, the most common one is the mid-axial lateral incision. Uh, in this way, uh, we drain the joint space. Uh, it is extensile. This, in, uh, this approach is extensile. means that it can extend proximal distal as you wish if it needed in future. And also, we don't um, catch out the 
uh, volar surface as much. So it's not treated then, it leads to a high rate of amputation, uh, septic arthritis of fingers. Nicotizing fasciitis is a very, very life-threatening infection uh, spreads along the fascia and hence the fascia needs to be removed. So it is very extensive, extensive uh, uh, infection and there are a few times, the most common one is still the polymicrobial. Type 2 is the one that we need to be careful of and we are sending the culture for the reason of that to look for group A beta hemolytic streptococcus because it's very life-threatening. Uh, physical examination is always unremarkable. Not always, but in a very early stage, it could be unremarkable. And uh, we must become a very astute um, observer to see, look for this uh, boule mottled skin. And the skin is whitish, mottled compared to the other side. So uh, high depth index of suspicion is, in, is important. So mimickers of infections, there are few, not many, but important. Uh, gout or pseudogout, they are in the, they are deposits of crystals in the joints. And uh, if you are doing extensive, unnecessary debridement for this kind of uh, uh, lesion, then uh, it could become a disaster in the future. Uh, acute cusphic tendinitis could look like infection. Pyogenic granuloma is the one that right lower slide, that one is the uh, granuloma. Pyogenic granulosome, left lower one, and uh, some spider bite. And some could uh, present as, uh, tumor can, could present as like a infection. The most likely organism is still uh, Staph aureus. Uh, if uh, any patient who comes with an uh, infection, uh, we must ask them about the, we must elicit the uh, history about uh, any immunocompromise. Uh, is the patient intravenous drug user? Is it diabetic? Is he taking some um, uh, steroids? So in this kind of patient, the most common one is polymicrobial infection having uh, the gram positive, gram negative, and anaerobic infection. MRSA, uh, community associated MRSA infection is uh, becoming more common and we need to be aware of that. And what have we talked about? We talked about various hand infections, all the appropriate treatments for these hand infections, and a few controversies, a uh, few cases of monitoring. Uh, some of them we need to uh, there's no need for surgery, infection, uh, surgery, surgical intervention. Not many. Uh, management is part of surgical practice. Uh, many people believe that um, hand infection is a uh, need a very specialized training, but what is needed, uh, according to the presenter, it is uh, the more aggressive management. Aggressive meaning that uh, aggressively. Um, draining the infection, uh, not to be very uh, stingy on the in incision. Uh, if there is a pocket, then we need to open. If there is a, a progression of the, of the infection, then we need to go in again to uh, do more deployment. Instead of waiting, dressing, this is what it means by aggressive management. Because aggressive management always, uh, not always, but most of the time will lead to better uh, treatment outcome. So uh, I present until here. Uh, if there's any question, then I'll take it. If not, then I'll go to uh, one case example by uh, Dr. Kao. Ada soalan tak? Tak ada teruskan. I think okay then uh, i'll move on to this um very interesting uh, case by dr Kao uh, from the us he, he had a patient with a six month history of uh, right palmar swelling this patient is uh immunocompromised type 1 diabetes for 30 years already but control so uh, the main complaint is the right palmar region has a swelling 
from the palm until the digits, uh, the index until the little finger. The other hand is completely normal and the finger has, cannot flex because of the swelling um, and the pain, of course. And the lab result turns out that the patient has a normal blood result other than a slightly raised ESR. Because at the time, the pain radiograph was normal. Um, so he proceeded with the MRI. MRI showed that there's a proliferative synovium infection uh, from the proximal palm into the fingers. Uh, these lesions uh, appeared in the MRI to be nodular, granulometers, and um, tendons and bones are normal. So uh, because he had the experience of treating such patients, so he didn't hesitate to explain to the patient and uh, went on to extensive wound development. And this is what they found in the intraoperatively. All the synovium are inflamed, swollen, and they look like a very small little nodules along the tendon shift. So everything need to be removed. Every uh, pathological looking thing need to be removed. So um, very extensive radical tenor synovectomy. Even the tendon pulleys are involved, which are involved, need to be removed. This is a typical case of a mycobacterium marinum infection. This is a, a, a non-tuberculous mycobacterium. Um, this is very uncommon soft tissue infection, but uh, is uh, present in immunocompromised host uh, who always, I mean, often uh, contact with marine or aquarium. Uh, sometimes the aquarium workers, uh, so they are slow growing. The diagnosis is delayed. Uh, this infection um, localized in a very cool environment such as a synovium. So this explains why it is in the tenosynovium area and they uh, will be there for very, very long time, a few months, and then causes swelling and symptoms. Um, this infection need uh, to be treated aggressively. And uh, if you want to find the proper uh, organism, then we need to send for a correct uh, culture. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Lewenstein, the Jensen Lewenstein uh, culture for mycobacterium, specifically in a low temperature, uh, 28, 30 degree, to uh, culture it for a few weeks and to get the proper diagnosis. And uh, chemotherapy, such as the uh, rifampin, nitambutol, doxycycline, are commonly effective after after a thorough deployment. Thank you very much.